Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, that we could come together as a family, Lord. We thank you that we have technology, Lord, that people in their homes today, we can gather as a family here, near, and far away, God, that we could come under your headship, Lord, to praise you, to worship you. Oh, Lord, our hearts long to be together today to praise your precious holy name. God, we pray as we open up your scriptures today, do a work deep inside our soul, Lord, because many need encouragement today, Heavenly Father, to draw to that well. Heavenly Father, strengthen us, God, by your scriptures. Give us hope, Heavenly Father, where we see no hope. Give us that horizon, Heavenly Father, to run to, to your Son. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, and we praise you, Lord God, and we just ask for your mercy. We ask for your holiness, Heavenly Father. Descend in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. We're together again. And all that are watching uh, on Facebook Live, I want to give a shout out from Waco, Texas, that's watching today. A good friend of mine that I love dearly, Nathan. Nathan, brother, I'm glad that you're on with us this morning. And as we read the scriptures, as we encourage one another, these are quite the times, isn't it? And, and the church wasn't ready for it. The government wasn't ready for it. But can I tell you something? Our God was ready for it. See, he drew us closer to himself. Despite all these things, we found out as a church, who do we lean on? It's God himself, not a building, not programs, but God himself. So if you'd turn with me this morning in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, as you get there, um, we're in the middle of a series, um, a short series called Family. And in this, we're looking at grasping the depths of our relationship with God through Christ and each other as a family. And there's no more appropriate time than now. I think about the Apostle Paul's prayer to the Ephesian church at, in the end of chapter 3 for spiritual strength. He says, for this reason, have you ever wondered, church, what brings you to your knees to bow before God in prayer? What does? He says, for this reason, he was praying for a church that he loved daily to be strengthened that from which every family in heaven and on earth is named. This family that we have, we have family already rejoicing in heaven, and we have family here. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that suppresses, suppress, surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Can you imagine this, church? This beautiful gospel prayer. Can you imagine those walk, watching at home today that this whole idea of family is greater than what we see on earth. That not we would only be filled with just pure knowledge of God, but that we would know God ourselves. And this is the ministry of this church, to know God, to know those heights and depths of God, to be strengthened in it, to be rooted in it, and grounded in it. I think of Psalm 1 where it said, Blessed is the man who doesn't stand in the counsel of the wicked, but he's like a tree planted by the streams of water. Can you just visualize this tree, this church planted by streams of water where the roots are deep, abiding in from the nutrients of this water, where their leaves, they, they are in season, they bear fruit in season. Can you imagine just as a church if we could grasp this as a family, even a measure of it, even a mustard seed of this, of this breath, this length, our God is incomprehensible. The height, his infinity, and the depth of God's love. 
Has anyone here or even watching at home this morning ever realized that mustard seed of this, of our infinite, incomprehensible nature of God? This series that we look at in Ephesians to explore these depths of love and family, the ones that are in heaven and on earth, all under Christ. And in this letter, he provides these illustrations for us and contrasting examples of such a family. It says in chapter 5, to be imitators of God as beloved children. And this implies a couple of things. To be imitators of someone is two things. One is knowledge. We have to know who we're imitating. And the second thing is observation. You have to see what our Father in Heaven is doing. And these times are tough that we're seeing what God is doing. But can I tell you that through suffering and through pain, we know one thing, God shows up in a big way. We can observe what God is doing and the hearts of His people drawing them back to the Word. More than ever, they're holding on to the scriptures, reading it to find out this beauty of God. We need to know who we're following and imitating. We need to know who, and we need to observe our God to see what he's doing. He hasn't left the building. In fact, you know, he's not this pro chess player who, who's got this giant chessboard in heaven And because we do this and do this, he makes another move. No, our God is already all-knowing. So we can observe our God in such a way that we can walk. We're encouraged in the beginning of chapter 5 to walk with our God in fragrant love, casting aside idols, pursuing purity, walking in the truth of our Abba Father. This illuminating light, it said in chapter 5, that we could walk in the light See, this light can change our homes. This light can change the world. Do you believe this? And then it's that wisdom that we can gain from the scriptures, that it's that lamp to our feet and the light to our path. This is what he's encouraging this church, all under the umbrella of the idea of being imitators. Being imitators. Being knowing of God, being observers of God. Because we spoke much about the home a couple weeks ago and how Christ, Christ sent it home and being fooled and directed by the Spirit of God imitates. It produces a place of thankfulness and gratitude. Even in the midst of circumstances like what we've been dealing with, all being isolated, and here we are today. And we, can, we will continue. It would be thankfulness and gratitude. It'd be a place of a common worship where the name of Jesus Christ would be lifted high and revered in adoration. It would be that type of place, and it would be offered to our Abba Father, our King. It would be a place of the reality of Christ, where we reference Him, and because of that, we submit to Him. You know, we, some people are losing their jobs through all of this. We know there's great injustices of this world. But when we submit ourselves fully to Christ, the all-knowing, the almighty, we can take away that stress and anxiety and place all our trust in him. And this is where we're going to begin today when we go back to Ephesians 5. We're going to re-look at a couple of verses. So why don't you stand with me this morning? We haven't done this in a while. So stand with me. And we're going to read uh, Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to read just two verses together. A little Bible time. Verses um, uh, 31 and 32. I'm sorry. Let's begin together. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ, the church. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. May his word be good seed on good soil today. You may be seated. So as we begin this morning, we start as always, it's got therefore. So we're going to have an opportunity just to take a step back just a little bit here to remember this backdrop. Remember this backdrop he said in chapter 5 about the whole idea about being imitators. So for us to really imitate 
and to really in context he gives us this beautiful contrast one is he gives us the contrast of the home relationship the husband and the wife relationship he gives us a contrast of this relationship between christ and his church in this text all that we would have knowledge of this we would have observation of this of our god and it's easy to forget all the implications of just being just being a child of god the implications for us of just being being his beloved children imitators of the heavenly image bearers of the creator and all too often this is pushed aside by life just gets busy doesn't it sometimes it's even been isolated hasn't it but scripture testifies to the believer of imitating being image bearers being witnesses of being likeness to the scriptures all over the old testament and the new testament teaches us and, and testifies to the fact that we bear the image of our creator the apostle paul writes to the church in second in second corinthians five twenty. therefore we're ambassadors for christ god making his appeal through us we implore you on behalf of christ to be reconciled to God here in this statement we're ambassadors we represent our Lord his ways his scriptures an ambassador never represents himself in public affairs he represents the one who sent them think about this you're a soldier you're a pilgrim for God this is in our home you know our family awaits us there's worship going on at the throne room of heaven there's a great banquet hall with a chair with your name on it. He's just waiting. And we know, when we know the God who sent us, and we observe all that he's done through the gospel, it encourages us. And some might say, who gives us the right to be that person? Who gives us that right? Or some people say, well, why should I say this? Because what is it about being this child of God about being this imitator we have the rightness of God the church has this rightness of God and why because we've been born again not by flesh and blood the scripture says but by a newness of life spirit and water this is what the prophet Ezekiel talked about in the Old Testament in chapter 36 there'd be a day where a new people these beloved children of God would come this is what the Lord spoke to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. We represent our Lord within the witness of Christ, within the gospel proclamation to the reconciliation for the sinner. This image of the ambassador bears much weight on all of us. Then we must ask ourselves why. Why so little evidence, uh, not evidence, but emphasis on the individual to reflect this image? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about the witness of the church today? The witness of the individuals today? So often what happens is we cower, we say, we just want to look like everybody else. But yet we've been called to this, to be image bearers of our Lord. And we need to reflect this in the church to proclaim this image to the home to be sanctified in this image and the intimate relationship of husband and wife to experience this image so my first point this morning is the imitator and image bearer must leave to cleave ephesians 5 31 a says therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the illustration the apostle paul gives here is really a practical one isn't it we all understand the dynamics of marriage whether you're married or not and and it's so practical that you get this picture of this young man leaving his father and his mother he leaves his old life he lives he leaves his old ways oh he leaves his old meals that his mother would make and he can still smell them he leaves everything behind to pursue a new life in marriage and for the groom and for the bride it's filled with great anticipation it's filled with dreams and hopes can you sense this church because sometimes when we get in this place of distress we can't see that horizon of hope 
We can't see these visions of hope. We can't see all the time what God is doing, but yet he's doing. And, and, and this should encourage us. When he gives this example, there's a reason for leaving. And there's a reason for cleaving. What a beautiful picture here as well as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who left the glories of heaven. He left his Father, the beauty and the grandeur of the throne room of God itself. He left all div he, in all divinity. He came. He was the radiance and still is of God's glory and the exact imprint of his nature, Hebrews 1.3. It's really safe to say in every way that his holiness and his knowledge, his power, that Jesus Christ was fully marked in the image of the Father in heaven. He came born miraculously to a virgin, taking on flesh fully without compromising his divinity fully. The groom was coming in search of his bride. Oh, what a picture. This is also a picture here of the sinner. The sinner who's been regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit, who testifies to the world. Just like the woman at the well. Once I was, but now I am. Once I was, but now I am. Romans 8, 8 and 9 says, But God shows his love for us, and while we were still sinners, while once I was, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Now I am. This is a testi testimony of the church to the world around us that once I was, but now I am. Ephesians 2, 1 and 2 says, And we were dead in our trespasses and in sins in which you once walked, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit, it is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Once I was a son of disobedience, but now I am a beloved child of God. How does that all that happen? It's a work of God, isn't it? Ephesians, look at the verse in Ephesians uh, chapter 2, 4 and 5. But God, and can I get an amen for but God? Because we need God. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. By grace. The imitator of Christ, the image of God, you must leave to cleave. And when you think of the implications of this, you think of Ephesians 4, 22 to 24, it says, to put off your old self. This means your old ways, your old attitudes, just like that young man in this illustration of marriage leaving his life behind him to pursue this other life with his future bride. Leaving all those old ways and old attitudes, which belongs, it says in the scripture, to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. To be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on a new self, a new self created after the likeness of God. And what does it say? In true righteousness, in true rightness with God and holiness because of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, to be an image bearer, to imitate, to know this God, to observe him throughout Scripture, you've got to leave, to cleave. If you think the regeneration keeps you exactly what you were, do you know this God? Do you know him? Christ follow you bear a mighty image of God. Mighty. And you must leave to cleave your old self to pursue of which Christ has for you to live in the holiness and the rightness of Christ. This, if you look at the, in this in all context, if you see this individually for yourself, that in your relationship with God, or if you're thinking this in context for the church, the body, the ecclesia, the called out ones, or if you're thinking about this in the context of your home this morning, or in the context of your marriage and relationships, faith will move you 
to leave something to pursue something. And it's costly, especially in the home when you want to follow Christ and if everybody else is not. My second point this morning is imitators and image bearers are uniquely made. Ephesians 31b, the two shall become one flesh. In this illustration, the Apostle Paul makes us go back, as he did earlier in the beginnings, in the book of beginnings in Genesis, to see this uniqueness that we have from God. In Genesis 1, 26 to 28, then God said, let us make man in our own image, after our likeness. Do you see the plural here? This is beautiful. You've been made in the image of God by the fullness of God, the triune God. Let us. And let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Not only is there a uniqueness, but he's given you dominion. He's actually given you power. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed the man, and God said to him, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. We're unique because who formed us? You're unique. The triune God. It's easy to forget our uniqueness. In fact, the church might have already forgot their uniqueness. And maybe this time that he's given us to be isolated in our homes is really to ask the question, who am I? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, when he was in prison, before he was getting ready to be put to death by his fellow Germans because he had a heart for the Jew and the Lord came to him, he wrote a poem, Who Am I? Where he literally just put his whole life down on paper. Things that people would see, is that really me? But he things that God would see within him. And if we lose our uniqueness, then we are the world. It's so easy to lose that. And then our pursuits become like everybody else. Our life pursuits, the most important thing, pay our mortgage, have a job. Yet our souls are destined for hell. It's easy to forget. God, the creator of the universe, from really a void of nothingness, right? And it says the heavens purely declare his glory. Psalm 9, 19, verse 1. The beauty and the majesty of this summer night that you could go outside and sit on your deck or take a walk and see those stars in the sky, to see his majesty. The earth, even the earth around us, the mountains, the lakes, the oceans, is his handiwork. And the heavens even declare his righteousness, the scriptures say. Psalm 50, verse 6. With all the rightness of God in precision, perfectly, placing stars and constellations glowing in the night sky. Uniqueness is important. We're not called to look like the world. We're called to look like our God, image bearers of our God. And this creator, the sustainer who created all things, he uniquely made male and female in his image. And not only that, in Psalm 139, 14, he says, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. You can see today how confused we can even be on our uniqueness. But our uniqueness as a church should be so important right now. As people struggle, as people long to know truth, that they could find truth in the scriptures and in God. Many have thought here the difference, that there may be a difference in the text where it says his image and his likeness. Because in his image is a snapshot. Is a picture you take with your camera. And his likeness is, is, is constant. His ever being. But the structure of the biblical language here, it's one and the same. In fact, it's an emphatic statement. Which implies this. Your icons of God in this world. Creatures made with a unique capacity. Created by God to reflect and mirror the character of God. Isn't that amazing? 
The word man here in Genesis 1.27 means all humankind. Both male and female are made in the image of God. And you are, you are unique not only because of who formed us, but you're unique because we're a reflection of him. And the reflection is intended for purpose for us. There's a purpose for us within our reflection. See, in paradise, we see that there were stewards of this. There were stewards of paradise, Adam and Eve. He was given dominion over everything. He was charged with being fruitful and multiply. Everything was under subjection to Adam. This is a beautiful illustration. And it's a picture, a shadow of our Lord. He came to seek and save the lost. He came, our Lord Jesus Christ, and then through his life, death, and resurrection, and in session, ascension to heaven, God placed all authority in heaven and on earth, all in subjection to Christ, and he's the steward of the paradise to come. And now, this gives you a picture of the bride of, to the groom for the individual believer being in unity and oneness with God through Christ. So we have union with him now. And by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, he transforms us into his image of his son. Your walk and your journey that God has created in you, guess what? It's for you. Let that sink in for you. That he so intimately knows you that this journey that he's given you and he's created for you, it's for you. And we're to be image bearers of him. And this, when you think about this, so often we live in this comparison game. We compare ourselves to everything. We compare how we look. We compare how much money we make. We compare ourselves to the neighbors. Churches compare themselves to other churches. When we're unique, it would take all those thoughts away from us that we could just be ourselves. And we could live out what God has for us. It's unique and it's glorious. 2 Corinthians 3.18 And we all with an unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. There's this idea of oneness throughout Scripture. Deuteronomy 6.4 What did he say to Israel? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There is a oneness with his creation. In John 17, 23, Jesus says this so well. He says, I in them, speaking them of his disciples, of his sheep, I, Jesus Christ, in them, and you and me, speaking of his Father in Christ, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved me, even as you loved me. What a picture of unity and oneness with the individual, the church, the home, the believer. This is a profound unity of oneness. We have God through Jesus Christ. And in this oneness we have, we see the illustration of the covenant of marriage between the husband and wife. Two individuals in total equal submission to each other, forming a complete oneness with God all knowing that each individual is unique, yet forming a new flesh. Oh, he said, you are the flesh of my flesh. There is a oneness that we have with God. And this is a oneness that any Christ follower, individually, married, single, dating, we have the unity with God. And we reflect that to others. This is the oneness of the church which Ephesians 11:12 speaks of. He gave some to be apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. This oneness shows different gifts, but of equal value. That he raises up people with gifts that would be treated all the same. The people who swing a hammer to the people who turn the page of the Bible. The people who speak on the street corners about Christ and the gospel to the person who delivers soup to the sick. There's a value of God, there's a oneness of equality 
with building up the body and the edification of the church. There's, it's unique. There's no place like this. It's not no corporate ladder that we're trying to climb or, you know, our own individualism. No, this is a, a, a oneness that we have with God that we're to share within our family and Christ being the center of our home. Then faith and life and the experience that we have is filled by the Holy Spirit bearing the image of our Creator. And then he'll be done in almighty love, with joy, with peace, with patience, with kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Oh, we're unique, church. You're unique. And we're supposed to live that uniqueness out for God, unashamedly to the world around us, to reflect the image of our God. And then finally, imitators and image bearers partake in a profound minute mystery. Ephesians 5.32, this mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. The idea of God's pre-falling commission for a man to leave his family and become one with his wife was ultimately intended to foreshadow Christ's relationship with his bride, the church, this was not clearly seen. There were shadows in the Old Testament scriptures, but it is now revealed in Christ, leaving his father's own side. And he came to cleave to his bride. Having returned to his father, he brings us with him to dwell before God forever. This is a profound truth. This might be hard for people to understand. That we have in the here and now something so precious and so unique. Such a great reward we have in our relationship and our union with Christ. And yet, there is future, there's even more. There's more. There's more waiting for us. There is more glory for us to experience in heaven. I love 1 Corinthians 15, 49. It says, just as we've been born by the image of man of dust. This man is the man of flesh. This was Adam. And just as we were born with him, carrying that sin that we have, it says we shall also bear the image of the man in heaven, the image of the redeemed. This is hope. This speaks of a glorious hope. Now, in the text, in the context of 1 Corinthians 15, 49, he's talking about the second coming of Christ, the resurrected body, and where we get this glorified body. But this really speaks of hope as well, of this new and everlasting covenant, this promise from God that we have. And this speaks of hope in a, where the mystery, the mysteries of the Bible and the victories of the Bible, they start dancing to the same song. When the great trumpet sounds and the music starts, 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58, I tell you this, brothers, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does perishable inherit imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not fall, all fall asleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must be put on imperishable. For the mortal body must be put on immortality. When the perishable puts on imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he encourages the church, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast in this. Be immovable in this. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, for your labor will never be in vain. This picture that he gives us, this great hope that he gives us, so many people that you know would ask the question, what happens when I die? So many people have that question, and what we have is hope. When, when Jesus Christ said today that you'd be in paradise, 
what happens. We should know these truths. We should be able to observe what God did through the resurrection of Christ. And so we know that we can give the hope to these people who ask these deep questions. For the soul goes to God. You pass away now. Some are not going to fall asleep like it says. They'll hear the trumpet sound. But some will. And it's not that they go to this other place for refinement. No, they go to the Lord. Absence from the body, present with the Lord in spirit. But there will be a time where he will collect his church once again. In fact, he says, if we pass with before he comes, we'll be coming with him. And he will raise an immortal body. We will get a glorified body. This is great hope. Not only is he taking us with him, but he's going to give us a new body, an everlasting body, something that's imperishable. There'll be no more mourning, no more tears, no more COVID-19. Nothing. There's a great hope that we have in Scripture. As you see these Scriptures and you see what an honor it is. What an honor, church to be image bearers of our God, to reflect this, to mirror this to the world around us. There's many in your neighborhood that are hopeless. There's many in your workplace, can I say, that are hopeless, that are longing for a hope. And you've been given the hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. See, if you're reading all this as in, just as an individual believer, or thinking about the church, of the homes of the Christians, or even in your marriage relationship with husband and wife, this image bearer carries much weight. I want you to know, carries much weight. But I have encouragement for you at all. This is truly, without a shadow of a doubt, an honor that God himself called you his beloved children. We have an Abba Father, what an honor it is to reflect him to our family, to our homes, to the church, and to the world. Wouldn't you say so? Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for you alone are holy and you alone are good. Heavenly Father, we just pray this morning, whether they're watching from home today, Lord, I pray that they'd be encouraged with hope, Heavenly Father. I pray, Lord God, for all that are here today as we gather, Lord, that our prayers would just be a fragrant offering to you, Heavenly Father. As we think of all the glory, we cannot escape the cross of Calvary, knowing that we were dead in our trespasses, but yet now we're alive. But God, and we say amen, that by your rich and mercy and love and grace, have called us, Heavenly Father, to yourself. You've called us beloved children, and you've asked of us, God, one thing, be imitators, to be image bearers to the world around us, God. I pray today for everyone here and watching at home that you'd feel the conviction of these scriptures, that we would take off our coats of the culture, that we would take off our coats of the world around us and that they would see how uniquely we are made in the eyes of God and we could tell others of this great uniqueness. Heavenly Father, I pray that if there's anyone watching today from home or anyone here that doesn't have this relationship with God, that might be confused on who they are. Oh, Heavenly Father, I think of when you Jesus was brought out to the desert, the wilderness, after his baptism. And Jesus tempted, I mean, Satan tempted Jesus in every way. But Jesus knew who he was. He could, he could calm those storms. He could, he could push away Satan because he knew exactly who he was. So, Heavenly Father, I pray for that strength. I pray that someone would call upon the name of the Lord this morning. That the Holy Spirit is nudging them and urging them and prompting them deep into their soul that they could find Christ today. Heavenly Father, we pray for this, Lord, as a church and as a people. And Heavenly Father, we pray today that in all that we did, in all that we said, that you were glorified. So we thank you, Heavenly Father. 
We praise you, Heavenly Father. And we pray that you are honored here today. In Jesus' name we pray.